One of the most important concepts in abstract algebra is the idea of two groups being isomorphic to each other. We've been talking about this concept for a long time. Uh, back in January was the first time that we introduced the concept of uh, the possibility of two different looking groups actually being isomorphic to each other. And as you'll recall, uh, at that time we had uh, defined two groups to be isomorphic to each other, provided that uh, they could both be represented by the same Cayley graph. One of the examples that we had looked at back then and since uh, were the two groups that I have identified here, represented here by a couple of different Cayley graphs. Let's just, uh, let's label these to begin with. I'm going to I'm going to label this vertex as the uh, identity element uh, for this group. Let's uh, go ahead and call this element A. We'll call this uh, element B. And so let's see, this would be, uh, we, could, we could name this AB. That would be a good name for, for that element. Perhaps AB A over here, maybe BA for this element. Okay, and so we said that, well, we can, if we can turn this Cayley graph into this one, eh, that's not exactly the best terminology. If we can represent this group by using this Cayley graph, then we can declare that the groups that are represented by these two Cayley graphs are isomorphic to each other. That was our definition. So we also said that uh, I'm going to pick uh, I'm going to pick this vertex up here to label as the identity element uh, for for this group, and we we noted uh, throughout our discussions that if any particular element has a particular property over here, some algebraic property, then we're going to have to make sure that um, where we represent it on this graph is going to have to allow it to have that same property. So, for example, the, the element that's going to be identified or that is going to be uh, assigned to this vertex, it's going to have to have order two. So, I'm going to, I'm going to pick an element over here that has order two and we'll just We'll just see if that's going to work. A seems like a good, a good choice. So let me call this, uh, let me let A be represented here. Let's see if I'm going to represent this by one of these elements. Um, it's going to have to have order three. So let's see which one would you pick. I, I, have, I have a couple of choices. I think I'm going to pick A, B. A, B has order three, doesn't it? A, B, A, B, A, B, and we're back to the identity again. So that seems like a good choice for this one. We'll call this A, B. Um, of course, if I call this A, B, then this is going to have to be A, B squared, right? So A, B, A, B. Well, what is that over here? A, B, A, B is B, A. So if I call this A, B, I'm going to be forced to call this one B, A. And let's see, what else do I have? Um, all right, well, the element that I assigned to this vertex, uh, so I'm starting at A and I'm going down a, uh, a solid arrow. Well, in this group, solid arrow means AB. So this is going to have to be A times AB. Well, what is that over here? A times AB. Let's see, AB is solid dash. So A times AB solid dash is B. So I'm going to have to call this one B. And there's only one left over here. Uh, this is going to have to be ABA, isn't it? Well, let's just make sure that that makes sense. Um, that would be starting here at AB and going up a dotted line. Well, a dotted line is in fact A. So this is going to have to be AB a, so that, that is right. We'll call that ABA. Okay. Um, and we could do a couple of checks just to make sure that uh, 
that this assignment actually works. I believe it does. Let's just, we'll just do a couple of calculations. So let's see, if I do, uh, uh, if I start at B and I follow it by a solid arrow, let's see what the solid arrow means. Solid arrow means AB. So I start at B and do a solid arrow. So B, A, B. Over here, well, let's see, what is that? B, A, B is A, B, A. B, and then A, B is a solid arrow over here. That is A, B, A. So that works. Um, let's see if I did A followed by A, B. A followed by A, B, I get B. And is that true over here? A followed by A, B. Here's A followed by A, B. I get B. Yeah, looks like we're good. Looks like we're, we're in good shape. I want to point something out here, and this is, this is crucial to our discussion, and it's critical to uh, refining our definition of what it means for two groups to be isomorphic. Um, what I want to do is, instead of using exactly the same labels here that I used over here, what I want to point out is what we've really done kind of implicitly here is we've defined a function from this group, I'll call this group G, to this group H, and we've done it as follows, right? So it really is poor form probably to use the same letters for two different settings, right? You're literally thinking of two different groups here. And so I probably shouldn't use exactly the same names. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of this idea of this function we've defined. And then here's how we've defined it. So we've basically, we've said, we're going to, we're going to send E to this vertex over here. So instead of just labeling it E again, let me call it F of E, right? So the functional value of E is, uh, is this vertex right here. The functional value of A, well, that's, that's what this is right here. So this is the, this is the functional value of A. Um, let's see, functional value of B, where's B? Here we go. So this vertex here is the functional value of B, um, functional value of A, B, functional value of A, B, A, and, uh, and the functional value of B, A. And that might seem like a small, a small difference, but it's, go, it's absolutely critical to what it is we're going to, uh, we're going to be doing in the rest of this talk. So just a couple things to point out. Because these are isomorphic to each other, um, whether I multiply, let's see, let's, let's, let's take, for example, a, B over here and multiply it. I'll let, uh, I'll let the asterisk be the operator over here, the operation on the first group. I'll let dot be the operation on the second one. If I multiply A, B by, I don't know, how about A, B, A? Right? Well, I, I fixed this up so that this is going to be the same as um, f of AB star. I'm sorry, this is a dot here. Dot. <laughs> You've got a big dot. f of ABA. Right? We can double check that. Right? AB, let's see, ABA is uh, solid dash solid. So if I start at A, B, and do solid dash solid, I get B. Over here, let's see, if I start at uh, F of A, B, and do F of A, B, A, let's see, how do I get to F of A, B, A? I guess solid dash is F of A, B, A. So I'll start here and do a solid and a dash, I get F of B. All right, so... Uh, Try that again. Yeah. Rewrite this. So AB times ABA was B. 
And over here, we have that f of a b dot f of a b a is f of b. All right, we had, we had fixed it up so that this, this had to happen, right? Um, let me, uh, let's, just, let's just try another one. So how about if we start at, uh, let's, how about if we start at a this time? We'll do a star, how about, uh, how about a, b? A star a, b is what? Well, let's see, here's a, and I'm gonna multiply that by a, b, so that's gonna give me b. I got B again. And if I looked over in the other group to see what F of A dot F of A B was, I bet I'm gonna get F of B. Let's let's give it a try. So let's see, F of A B is just a just a solid line. So if I start at F of A and do a solid line, look at that. I, I'm at F of B exactly. All right. One more for good measure. Um, so how about if I start at B and I multiply by, uh, how about I multiply by AB? See what I get. Let's see, so B, here it is, times AB gives me ABA. And over here, if I do F of B dot F of AB, well, I get, well, I bet I'm going to get F of ABA, but let's double check. So again, F of AB is just a, just a solid arrow. And so if I start at F of B and do a solid arrow, sure enough, I get to F of ABA. Right, so it looks like every time what's happening is that if I multiply two elements together over here in G, and I get some element, I don't know, say z. Well, the functional values of those two elements in the other group multiplied together give me f of z every time. And this is an idea that we, we call uh, operation preservation. So this property, the property that, uh, that if, uh, if x times y is equal to z, if that implies that f of x times f of y is f of z for all the elements in the group, then we say that f preserves the operation. on G. All right, so F's a function that, uh, that pre preserves the operation on G. If I multiply two things together, an X and a Y over here and get Z, then F of X times F of Y over here is going to give me F of Z. All right, and so that is the idea of uh, what happens or what can happen whenever I have two groups that are isomorphic to one another, All right? So I'm just gonna repeat this again. So if a function f from a group g to a group h is, we say that such a function is going to preserve the operation on g provided that, now let's see, x star y equals z and g implies, what's it gonna imply? that f of x times f of y is equal to f of z in group H. Now, that's kind of a long way to say this. Let me, let me rewrite this one more time. So x star y equals z in G implies that f of x dot f of y is f of z in h. And I've said exactly the same thing, but let me add to this just a little bit. 
right? If x star y is z, then certainly f of x star y is f of z. And so saying this, writing all of this, really implies that, well, let's see, I have f of z both times on the right, right hand side over here. So what it really says is that this is equal to this. And I don't have to reference z at all. So instead of saying all of this, well, I'll say this is one way of saying it, a long way. The shorter way of saying that, the abbreviated way, the cleaner way, the more efficient way, and the way you're going to see in any standard text in abstract algebra is that a function f is said to preserve the operation on g provided that f of x star y equals f of x dot f of y for all x and y in group G. So that's our definition of operation preservation. It might actually be maybe a little more straightforward to see this in a table. So here I have the elements of elements of G are over here, elements of H are over here. We might want to remind ourselves how, the, how all these are defined. So let's say, for example, that I want to uh, let's look at B A B here, right? So what's going to go right in this spot. Let's see. So B times AB. Well, let's look at it. B times AB. That's ABA. If I look at uh, if I look at the corresponding elements over here. So I did B and AB. So over here I'll do F of B and F of AB. And uh, we'll go ahead and use our graph here to decide what that is. So if I take f of b, where is f of b? Here it is. And uh, f of a, b is solid arrow. So start at f of b, do solid arrow, I get f of a, b, a, b, a. Right, which is exactly what I expected to get. And in fact, if I filled in the rest of the table, those same correspondences would, would occur. And so here's another way of showing that uh, if I've got B star AB over here, and I look at its functional value, Now, let's look at its value first, ABA, right? If I looked at its functional value, of course, that's going to be F of ABA. But F of ABA was what I got whenever I multiplied F of B with F of AB, right? So again, f of b star a b is equal to f of b dot f of a b. Right. So one more time, because this is such an important definition. We say that f preserves the operation. on G, provided that
right? And it really didn't matter what the elements were here, right? I used any x star y, and that was equal to some z. Well, that would mean that f of x star y was f of z, because a function can only send an element to one thing, right? But what we have over here is f of x dot f of y, right? So we say that f preserves the operation on g provided that f of x star y equals f of x dot f of y for all x, y, the group G. This is setting us up to define the two most important terms in all of abstract algebra. I think most algebraists would agree with that, uh, that assessment. And that's the idea of, well, what it means for two groups to be isomorphic and what we mean by the function that shows us that two groups are isomorphic. This function that we identified up here is what we're going to call it an isomorphism. And so our definitions go like this, right? Two groups, G and H are said to be isomorphic to one another, provided that, now we didn't talk about this, we will hear in just a moment, provided there exists a bijection, not just a function, but a bijection from G to H that preserves the operation on G. Right, we were just talking about a function before, but if you think about it, if these two groups are going to be identical, well, and I'm gonna show that by reassigning the elements over here to vertices over there, every one of these vertices can only, every one of these elements can only go, go to one place. I can only have one thing, which is identified as A over here, right? So my function is going to have to be one-to-one. -one. Also, I'm gonna to have to assign something to each of my vertices over here. And so my function is gonna to have to be onto. And we've already at length talked about why the function is going to have to be operation preserving. So, Two groups are said to be isomorphic provided that there is that one-to-one -one and onto function that preserves the operation on the group. That function is called an isomorphism, right? So if we can find a bijection that preserves the operation, we say that the two groups are isomorphic to each other and we call that function an isomorphism from the one group to the other. Now I wanna show you why this idea, why this new way of defining the notion of two groups being isomorphic is in some sense better than the definition we were using before. Now the definition we were using before, remember definition we were using before said that two groups are isomorphic provided that we can use the same Cayley graph to represent them both, right? So this group is isomorphic to this group because I can use this Cayley graph to represent this group. That's great. It's a very intuitive way of thinking about two groups being isomorphic. But it's not a very efficient way whenever we're trying to show, whenever we're trying to prove that two groups are isomorphic. Let me give you an example. Let's say that we want to prove that, uh, that the groups Z8 cross Z9, that the group Z8 cross Z9 is isomorphic to the group Z9 cross Z8, right? Those are different groups. Their ordered pairs are different, right? If I have an ordered pair, uh, 
that represents a, an element of Z8 cross uh, Z9. The first element can only uh, take on the values zero through seven. And the second element can only take on the values zero through eight. But that's reversed over here. Right? An element over here, the first uh, coordinate can only take on uh, value zero through eight. The second one can take on value zero through seven. Right? They're reversed. These are different groups. And if I were to show that they were isomorphic using our old definition, I would have to draw a Cayley graph of Z8 cross Z9. And that's going to be, that's going to be pretty big. It's going to have 72 elements in it. And it's going to have a whole bunch of lines connecting a whole bunch of vertices. It's going to be a mess. It's going to have a Cayley graph representing Z9 cross Z8. It's going to look different. It's going to be a mess. And then I'm going to have to show that I could use, say, this graph to represent the other one. Be a nightmare. But with our new definition, this turns out to be very, very easy. And let me, let me show you why. All right, so our plan is that uh, what we want to do is define a function from Z8 cross Z9 to Z9 cross Z8 that we believe might be an isomorphism and then show that it really is. That'll be enough, right? Because an isomorphism is a bijection uh, between the two groups that preserves the operation. And what's it mean for the two groups to be isomorphic? Well, it means that there's a bijection between the two groups that preserves the operation. So if we can find an isomorphism between the two, then that will be enough to show me that, uh, that those two groups are isomorphic. So here's the idea. So I've, I've, I've written out the proof. Let's, let's go through it. So a natural function for us to consider is the one that sends an element of Z8 cross Z9 to Z9 cross Z8 in, in this very natural way. So let's take an element A, B. So, right, so A is something between 0 and 7. B is something between 0 and 8. Right, it's in Z8 cross Z9. And I'm going to define it to be... I'm going to define uh, f of a, b to be b comma a. Well, that's in, if, if a, b is in z, a cross e 9 then b, a, reversing the elements, that's going to be in, or reversing the coordinates, that's going to be in z, 9 cross z, 8, right? So clearly, we have the b, a is in our target group, our codomain, provided that, uh, provided that uh, A is in fact in Z8 and B is in Z9. All right, so let's show that it's one to one. This is pretty quick. How do we usually show that uh, we have a one to one function? Well, we take two elements that went to the same thing and prove that they must have been the same element. Well, let's see. So if I have two such elements, then by definition of F, f of a, b is going to be b, a, f of c, d is going to be d, c, right? So I have these two things in uh, z9 cross z8. And so since these are identical as uh, ordered pairs, that must mean that our first coordinates are equal and our second coordinates are equal, right? So b is d and a is c. Well, but if that's the case, if A is C, then writing these two ordered pairs, let's see, that, that's going to make the first coordinates the same. It's going to make the second coordinates the same. And so A, B, and C, D are the same. So sure enough, if, I, if A and B and C and D were uh, elements in Z8 cross Z9 that F mapped to the same thing, then we had the same elements in the first place. So functions one to one. Is the function on to? Well, let's start with something that's in Z9 cross Z8. Well, that means that, uh, right, if BA is in there, then reversing A and B gives me something in Z8 cross Z9. And moreover, by our definition of F, F's going to send AB to BA. Well, that's what we picked in the first place. 
So if I take anything out of my codomain, I can find something in my domain that F sends to my codomain element. So the function's on to. So, so far we have that F is a bijection. Is it operation preserving? Well, let's pick two things out of Z8 cross Z9. And let's see what F, where F sends their, their, uh, their sum. Well, here we go. So let's see, by definition of uh, the operation on the cross product, on the, I'm sorry, on the direct product, uh, AB plus CD is going to be A plus C comma B plus D, right? And in the first case, I'm using addition mod eight. Here I'm using addition mod nine because A and C are both in Z8, B and D are both in Z9. But by definition, F sends this ordered pair to the ordered pair I get whenever I reverse those coordinates. But this is exactly what it means to uh, write uh, BA plus DC. Well, that's exactly, so BA is exactly F of AB. DC is exactly F of CD. And so I have my operation preservation condition met, right? It doesn't matter if I add first and then look at uh, the image, or if I look at the images first and do my addition over in the, over in the codomain. So this proof right here shows me that I can take the take a Cayley graph representing Z9 cross Z8 and use it to represent a Cayley graph for Z8 cross Z9. And I never had to draw a Cayley graph at all. And I think you'd agree that the time we spent doing this is far less than the time we would have spent the time we would have spent trying to uh, show that the two Cayley graphs uh, or that one group could be represented by the Cayley graph of the other. In fact, think about this for just a moment. What if I used any group up here, so say G cross H, and claimed that that was isomorphic to H cross G? That is a fact actually that you will be showing in homework. Could you use Cayley graphs to do that? Well, you don't know what G and H are. So how could you draw Cayley graphs for them at all? But I think you could probably write a proof similar to this one that showed that it could be done. There are some theorems about isomorphic groups, um, many actually. Uh, I'd like to look at a couple of them now. So we had said some time ago that if we've got um, a couple of groups that are isomorphic to each other and there are special properties that one, uh, that elements, that an element has in one group that uh, the, the isomorphism is going to have to send it to something that has that same property. So one of the things we noted is that since uh, there is only one identity element in any, any group, an isomorphism is going to have to send that identity element to the identity element in the other group. But I'd like to use the definition that we've just developed in order to verify, actually to prove, that that is, that that is true, to show that that fact follows from our definition. So I'm going to start with two groups, G and H. And let's say that the, the group G has identity element that I'll just identify it as E sub G, identity element in H is E sub H. And if, I, and if these groups do happen to be isomorphic, in other words, if I can find an isomorphism between them, then that isomorphism is going to have to send 
the identity element from the one group to the identity element of the other. This is actually a very easy proof. I'm just going to note that, uh, let's see, f of e sub g, eventually we have to show that that's equal to the identity element in h, but I think you would agree that uh, e sub g is the same element as e sub g times e sub g, right, times itself. It is the identity element after all. And so e sub g is going to have to equal the product of e sub g with itself. And so obviously it's the same element, so I have to, so f's going to send it to the same thing. But the definition of isomorphism, the, the operation preserving part, tells me that this has to be f of eg, and I'm using dot whenever I'm working in h. So dot f of eg, right? So just to be clear, this is f of eg over here, right? So uh, what else? Let's see. So I know that, uh, well, since I'm working in H, and H is a group, whatever this element is, well, I haven't shown yet what it is, but I do know that whatever it is, it's going to have an inverse. So I can multiply on the left by that inverse, but then I'd also have to multiply on the right by that inverse. There we go. And then by associativity, I could rewrite this as f of uh, eg dot f eg dot f of e.g. inverse. So what have I got? Well, this is the identity element in H. Right? An element times its inverse is the, is the identity element. So on the right I have f of e.g. On the left I have, well, I have an element times its inverse. That's the identity element in H. And that's exactly what I was trying to show. So that's using the definition that we've developed of an isomorphism to prove the fact that um, the identity element in the one group is going to have to go to the identity element in the other. Let's look at another, look at another uh, fact about isomorphisms. We talked about this a little bit early on in the semester, uh, whenever we were still using our Cayley graph definition for uh, showing that two groups were isomorphic to each other. If I've got a couple of groups that are isomorphic and I've got an isomorphism from G to H, then whatever the order of an element is in G is going to have to be the same as the order of that element in uh, the image of that element in, in H. So, right, so if I have an element X that has order three, and we even talked about that here, right? We noted that uh, in this group over here, whatever I labeled this element as would have to be an element of order three. So I looked over here for elements of order three. I chose AB, right? So I was using that idea, but now we can prove that this is going to be the case, and I'm going to use the, the definition in order to do that. So let's go ahead and let n be the order of x and m the order of f of x. And, and just as a reminder, what, right, what this means is that, uh, well, not only does it mean that x to the n is going to be the identity element, but it's also the smallest um, 
integer for which that's true, right? If, if n happened to be three, then uh, uh, x to the first nor x to the second could, could possibly be the identity, right? And three would have been the, uh, the least integer. Right? Over here, this says that uh, m is the smallest integer that I could raise f of x to in order to get the identity over an h. Okay, so let's, let's continue with the proof. So x to the n is equal to e to the g, but, but that means, well, let's see. So if these two are the same elements, then their functional values have to be equal. Right, I can only send an element to the same thing. I can only send an element to one thing, so these guys have to be the same. We've already identified that f of e g has to be e h. Okay, so now we're gonna use the operation preservation property of an isomorphism, right? This is taking a whole bunch of copies of x, n copies in fact, and multiplying them together. Well, f preserves the operation. So if I multiplied a whole bunch of x's together and then looked at the image, I'm gonna get the same thing as if I looked at the image of x and multiplied that image together n times. So I have this. Well, okay. So n is a power that I can raise f of x to to give me the identity. But m being the order of f of x, m's the smallest integer that does, that does the same thing, right? So I also know that f of x raised to the mth power is e to the h. But since m's the smallest such thing, that means that m has to be less than or equal to n. Right again, since m is the least positive integer for which f of x to the m is equal to e to the h. Okay, so we have that, uh, we don't have their equal yet, but at least we have that m is less than or equal to n. All right, well, let's keep going. So also, since m is the order of f of x, we know that well, if I raise f of x to the nth power, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the identity element. Well, operation preservation is going to come into play again, right? So if, if I multiply f of x together m times, uh, that's the same thing as multiplying x together m times and then looking at the image, right? So that gives me e to the h. But as before, we've noted that uh, e to the h is going to be the functional value of uh, not e to the h, e sub h is going to be the function of i of uh, e sub g. Right? The identity element can only go to the identity element. And so this shows me, well, let's see. f of x to the m is equal to f of e to the g. But f's one to one. So the only way that can happen is if, you ready? Do you remember? Can you, can you see what's coming? Since f is one to one, and it sends x to the m and e, to the, and e sub g to the same thing, that must mean that x to the m and e sub g are the same thing, right? That's because, that's because f is one to one. Well, remember again, n is the order of x, and n is the smallest thing the smallest power of x that's equal to the identity. So since m is also a power of x, since x to the m is, is, is a power of x that's equal to the identity, since n's the smallest thing that does that, that must mean that n is less than or equal to m. Right, again, because n is the least positive integer with this property. Right, so I've got that m is less than or equal to n, and also n is less than or equal to m. The only conclusion we can draw from that is that m and n must be equal to each other. And that does it, right? m and n were the orders of x and f of x respectively, and we've just showed they're equal to each other. Some more theorems. So, Let's assume that uh, G and H are groups, and let's let F be an isomorphism from G to H. Our notes say that, uh, let's see, the result 
in uh, number 171 says that if x is in g, then the inverse of x is going to get sent to the inverse of f of x. So the inverse of x in g, f's going to send it to the inverse of f of x. Might have guessed that from our uh, more intuitive definition of isomorphisms from before, but uh, we can use the definition to prove it. Number 173 says that uh, uh, there exists an isomorphism from G to itself. That's not too surprising, right? I mean, obviously, a group can be represented by the same Cayley graph of, that, of, that, of itself. And so using our old definition, that's really straightforward. But we can identify an isomorphism from G to G, there, therefore proving that fact using the definition. I want you to do those two for homework. I'd also like you to look at uh, number 168. This is the one that says uh, um, G cross H is isomorphic to, uh, to H cross G for any groups, G and H, right? We did it for Z8 cross Z9, but uh, I want you to do it in general. And then uh, the result in number 174, I'd like you to, to, to do that as well. So four, four exercises for homework, and uh, that'll be it for today. This was probably the most important material that we've covered uh, this year. Certainly the most fundamental material, uh, introducing the, the two notions of, uh, first of all, what it means for two groups to be isomorphic to each other uh, in, the, in the traditional sense rather than the intuitive sense that we've been using all semester. And then what it means for a function to be an isomorphism, right? A function which is bijective, one one and onto, uh, and which is operation preserving, right? So those are probably the most, most important definitions in abstract algebra. Make sure that, uh, that you understand them completely very solidly. Uh, you might want to watch this video a couple, a couple more times, perhaps, uh, just to make sure that all that is solidif solidified and, uh, and that you have full mastery of it. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe, stay well, take care.